Lazarus is a man uh, that is associated with uh, Colossae. Colossae. Uh, he had reported to Paul while Paul was in prison. And so that's what brings about uh, there it goes. That's what brings about the writing of this letter. And really we've got a couple of things going on in Colossians. He's going to be warning them against false teaching. And we're going to use the word heresy, which is not a word we use a lot. And so just to define it, it's anything that's against church teaching. It's heresy. Well, in, in olden days, they used that word a lot. Now, not so much. Uh, we, don't, we don't throw it around a lot. Uh, so there's a lot of things that's against church doctrine. Uh, and we're, I guess we're more politically correct, I guess. I don't know if that's bad or good. Uh, some people were real quick to call things heresy. Um, anyway, warning against false teaching. We're going to talk about some of those things that's coming up. The deity of Christ is going to come up. Uh, and that is fundamental to us as Christians. Um, and then just general things on Christian living is uh, in, in Colossians. Now, a critical introduction looks at the date and the time and the author and that sort of thing. Um, most scholars are going to say, well, this is Paul uh, that wrote this during his imprisonment at Rome. Uh, and you remember the prison epistles. And you should be able to name them by now, although I never can. But you guys with good memory, uh, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and then Philemon. Uh, usually we say, well, those are prison epistles. They were written about the same time uh, while Paul was in prison. Uh, so it would be 60 to 62 A.D. Uh, Colossians 4, 3, and 4, he says, I am in prison. We know he's in prison. There's some discussion as which prison, uh, because he was in prison often, a lot, you know. Uh, he would get in trouble in just about every town. Uh, and he'd go to the next town and do it all over again. Uh, he, he's a better man than I am. Uh, Aristarchus is with him, and he says he is my fellow prisoner. So at, at one point, uh, when he writes Colossians, Aristarchus is a fellow prisoner in Colossians 4, 10, and 11. Uh, now, someone wants to say this book is pseudonymous. It's not a word we get to use very often. Uh, if you're writing somebody uh, something and you write somebody else's name, we say that it's pseudonymous. It's your vocabulary word for the day. <laughs> uh, so Paul, you know, they will write this and, and say Paul wrote it. Well, today we say, well, that would be very unethical to do that. If you publish it, it could be illegal. If I write something and say, uh, you know, John Smith wrote this and, and published it. John Smith might not like that. He could sue me, right? Uh, I could get in trouble legally. Well, when they did this at that time, it was not unethical or, or illegal. In fact, they would say, I'm honoring this person. Uh, that's why we have, like later on, we'll have the Gospel of Thomas. Uh, you've probably heard of that. It's one of the uh, lost books of the Bible, they say. Um, they wrote the Gospel of Thomas like 300 years after Thomas had lived, but they really liked Thomas, and so they wanted to honor him. The Gnostics uh, is a heresy that we're going to talk a little bit about. Uh, it comes up, they come up every now and then. Uh, but they really liked Thomas because he questioned the resurrection of Christ. 
And so they really like to honor him. Well, they wrote the Gospel of Thomas. Uh, it's spurious. It's not written by Thomas, and but it is synonymous. There's your good word. Um, so that's all that. So it's funny. It, if you have most of the people saying one thing, there's always this one guy that says something different. And, you know, there's always the conspiracy theorists. Uh, we have that today uh, for just about everything. Um, so there's always one guy saying, well, no, this isn't really Paul. This is somebody else. And they'll start naming other people that it could be. Most of the time, we'll just settle on Paul. Uh, let's look at the city of Colossae. Of course, I like to start with a map. And you can see the red arrow there. There's, there's three little towns there in the Lycus Valley, uh, Peropolis, Laodicea, and Colossae. And they were really linked together in a lot of ways. If you look at the map of Paul's journeys, he goes all around Colossae, but he never really makes it. So he didn't establish the church there. Let me back up. So you can see Heropolis, Laodicea, and Colossae. Um, they're linked together. Now, Colossae was important at one time uh, before this was written. Um, but they changed the route. It was on the trade route, and then they changed where the route went. And so it, it is becoming less important. There's going to be an earthquake like five years after Paul writes this. And Colossae really was never fully rebuilt. Uh, it's kind of a ruin today. Um, but when he, Paul wrote this, he'd not been there, but he'd heard about them. And he wanted to you know, talk about these, these problems that they had and then encourage them to Christian living. Um, so the trade route had kind of moved, and so they weren't on the trade route anymore. You remember uh, hearing about uh, Route 66 was kind of a big deal once upon a time. But then what happened? Well, the interstate happened. <laughs> and some of those towns that were thriving, uh, inter Route 66 went from Chicago to L.A., and people would just love to drive that. Well, when the interstate happened, some of those towns have dried up. And that's kind of the same thing that's happening, or that happened later on to Colossae. So if you look on a larger map like this, just find Ephesus and go over about, go over east about 100 miles, and that's where it is. So Paul's modus operandi uh, would be he would go to a town and he would have his helpers go to the littler towns around. And some people have called it Paul's traveling school of preaching uh, because of this. So Paul had heard about them, and he had prayed for them, uh, but he had not been there personally. All right. So the people were pagans, mostly. Uh, there were some Jews, about 11,000 in the Tri-City area. Remember uh, last last time, there were there were not enough Jews to make a synagogue. You had to have ten for a synagogue. Well, here we got eleven thousand in the area, so there's more of a Jewish influence. And we're going to see that coming up in some of the problems uh, because of that. So when we say they are very religious. Remember, the religion is paganism. They're worshiping the Greek gods. And to us, we call them you know, the Greek myths. They were gods to them. And they actively worshiped them. Now, the problem is, this was purely ritual. They're going through the motions, but it didn't carry over to morality. All right? And we have to be careful of that today, do we not? Oh, man, 
I go to church every Sunday. I, you know, give my money. I haven't killed anybody, you know, whatever. We think I'm a pretty good guy. Is it just ritual? Or does it influence every aspect of our life? One thing he says, Colossians 3.17, do all in the Lord. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the Lord. Think about that. Everything you're doing throughout your day, are you doing that in the name of the Lord? So really, Christianity is not just going through the motions, doing my checkoff list. Ready? I did this, 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 this. I'm all good. When I get to heaven, I'll get a free pass because I've done these things. Now, it's more than that, guys. It's every aspect of our life. Now, the pagans, they had gods all over the place. They had a number of gods even in their homes that they would go through the motion of obeisance. Uh, they, they would perform the rituals. They would, you know do the incense, they, whatever it was. But it didn't affect their morality. It didn't affect even how they thought. It's like, man, I'm getting my ticket punched. I'm good with that God. And I haven't insulted that God. I'm good to go. Something bad happens. Well, you've made a God mad at you. And not only do you need to worship this God, but you need to worship this one because he'll get jealous if you worship that one. Just crazy stuff. And so, you know, that, that's going to come up. Very religious. And so even like when Paul's in Athens, he says, I know you are very religious. That's what he's talking about. They did religion really well. <laughs> but, you know, use that as a springboard. What do we really want to worship? The problem is the root when we get down to it. Men want to create their own religion, do they not? And I've talked to people. They kind of create their own deal. One lady says, me and God, we got a deal. <laughs> she, she's created her own religion just for her to follow. Me and God, we got a deal. And, you know, that's really all she wanted to say about that. That's her own religion. She's made that up. And somehow, you know, she's come to that conclusion. Well, they've done this. Men want to make their own religion. Uh, they want to write their own doctrine rather than get their doctrine from God. All right, let's go on. Let's look at the church in Colossae. Uh, as we've said, we don't know really when it began. Uh, probably when Paul was in Ephesus, he'd send guys out. Uh, it might have been Epaphras. He was very closely associated with Colossae. Uh, Epaphras may have been from Colossae. Uh, Colossians 4.12, Epaphras, who is one of you, servant of Christ Jesus, greets you. So he was with Paul when that was written, and he says, Epaphras, who's from there, he greets you. Always struggling on your behalf in his prayers, that you may stand mature and fully assured in all the will of God. So Paul had not known, or he had known of the church, but he hadn't been there. How do we know? Colossians 2, 1, he says, I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you. And for those at Laodicea, just one of their sister cities, and for all who have not seen me face to face. So he had not been there. Uh, Laodicea, you're going to recognize that that's one of the seven churches of Asia. And so that, that one will come up later. So they're kind of, they're kind of together there, those, those tri cities. Uh, the church was probably. Uh, as we said, an outgrowth of his mission from Ephesus. Uh, he had spent two years, Acts 19.10, he continued two years there uh, in Ephesus so that all the residents of Asia 
heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. So Asia, we, we consider that the whole continent. At that time, Asia was just that Roman province. And so uh, that's that. Uh, we've heard of your faith, Colossians 1, 3, and 4. Uh, we thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, and we pray for you since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints. So he had heard about them, uh, word of their present condition, had come to Paul uh, through Epaphras, Colossians 4.12, and then Philemon. Colossians and Philemon are very closely linked. Uh, sometimes you just study both of them together. Philemon is a really short letter written to Philemon about Onesimus escaped slave, and Paul sending him back home. Uh, and so Onesimus is going to be related uh, to this area as well. Uh, so you got Archippus, A-R-C-H-I-P-P-U-S, uh, Colossians 4, 17. Say to Archippus, see that you fulfill the ministry that you received in the, in the Lord. He may have been the minister there. Um, the idea of a paid full-time minister hadn't yet developed at this time. Maybe he was a working minister. And really, I, I've heard that's becoming. Uh, you know, people have a job and then they preach also. Uh, and I've known missionaries that have done that. Uh, the church is in the home of A-P-P-H-I-A, Athia sister, Atha, how would you say that, A-T-T-H-I-A, and so some want to say, well, this is all one family, Philemon was the father, Athia was the mother, Archippus the son, we're not really told that in so many words, it would really fit nicely though, uh, if it was that way, we don't know, uh, but the church met in the home of this lady. Onesimus is also connected there. He was uh, the escaped slave, and we've mentioned him. Colossians 4, beginning in verse 7, Tychicus will tell you about my activity. So the letter was sent by the man named Tychicus. He will tell you about all my activities. He is a beloved brother and a faithful minister and a fellow servant in the Lord. I have sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are, and that he, that he may encourage your heart. And with him, Onesimus, our faithful and beloved brother, who is one of you. So they already knew about it. They will tell you of everything that has taken place here. So he's connected also. Uh, they knew Onesimus. So he was from the Epaphras, Colossians 4.12, uh, of course, is one of you. Epaphras was there with him uh, in Philemon 123. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner. So Paul had worked in Ephesus, and, and if you want to read about that, Acts 19 uh, and 20. Uh, he'd worked in Ephesus about 52 to 55. So this is like 10 years later when he writes this letter. And they've had time to mature, and, but then also there's some things we need to take care of. There's some heresy that we need to take care of. Uh, so it really hasn't been all that long. Uh, look in Colossians 1, 7, and 8. Let's see, have we read that? In 1, 7, and 8, just as you've learned it from Epaphras, our fellow, our beloved fellow servant, he is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf and has made known to us your love in the Spirit. So he's, he's heard some good things about them. Go down to uh, Colossians 2, 16. And here we get uh, the... Uh, 
a hint of, of some of the problems that's going on here. Uh, he mentions uh, the beloved son, and, and he's talking about Christ. And in verse 15, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. We're going to talk about that again in a minute. For by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him, uh, to reconcile to himself all things, whether on heaven or in earth, making peace by the blood of Christ. So they had a problem with the deity of Christ. They're lowering the value of Christ, or devaluing Christ, so that Paul is trying to set things right. Man, he is preeminent. He's first place. Uh, nothing should come before him. Nothing should devalue uh, the place of Christ. So they had combined elements of, of Greek philosophy. This gets back into Homer and Plato. Their writings were still around, uh, so some of their thoughts uh, are going to be popping up uh, even, even until now. Um, then you get into you know, the, the, the myth, the Greek myth, the Greek theology. Uh, then you're going to get into Jewish legalism that we've talked about a lot before where the Jews are bringing in, trying to bring in the law of Moses. And, and what they did, they put tradition on the same level as scripture. And when you start doing that, you're going to have problems. All right. So there was a large body of the written Jewish tradition of uh, Talmud and uh, uh, what's the other? There's, there's two large volumes of, of Jewish tradition. They put that right up there next to Scripture. And Jesus said, "You know what? You know they accused Jesus of breaking the law. Do you remember this in studying the life of Christ? And he hadn't really broken the law. He'd broken their tradition uh, that they had put right up there." sometimes above the law. And so, you know, it wasn't that he was breaking the, the law itself, but they had made their tradition law. All right, so that's kind of what's going on in, in Colossae. Mostly, you know, good report, but there's some things we still, you know, there's cause for alarm. Uh, we've heard of your faith, Colossians 1.4. Uh, in Colossians 2.5, he says, Although I'm absent in body, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see of your good order and the firmness of your faith in Christ. So he's, he's warning them about some things that might cause problems. But really, he's, he's happy. He says they've got firmness in, in, in their faith in Christ. There is some cause to alarm, Colossians 2.6. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy. That's you know, Homer and Plato stuff coming down, some of the uh, things going on. Uh, we're going to talk about the Stoics in a minute. Uh, that's the philosophy. Empty deceit. All right. According to human tradition, and we've talked about that, according to the elemental spirits of the world, we're going to talk about spiritual beings, we're going to talk about angels, and not according to Christ. Okay, so here's the warning. Don't get into these things. These things are not according to Christ, is, is the bottom line. Go down to Colossians, well, we've already read uh, 2, 15 through there. So you've got elements of this false Greek philosophy, the myth, the Jewish, the Jewish legalism. They were getting into angel worship. Look at verse 18. He is
is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginner, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. They were developing this hierarchy that included angels. All right? Now, we're going to talk about angels and angel worship. Angels are created beings. They are messengers of God. Imagine if you met one, they'd be pretty scary. Because what's the first thing an angel says when he, when he shows up? Don't be afraid. <laughs> and if you hear the description of angels in Isaiah, that would be something you'd be afraid of. Now, they can disguise themselves as, as humans and go unnoticed. But if they show up in their true form, you'll be afraid. Uh, trust me. They are not to be worshipped. They are way cool, and we like to think about angels. Uh, they are not to be worshipped. Why? Christ is preeminent. If you put anything else up there with Christ, you are devaluing the Son of God, is the idea. Then we get into asceticism, which we, we, we hear about sometimes today. It's the harsh treatment of your body to control lust. In Colossians 2, 20 through 22. If with Christ you have died, the elemental spirits of, uh, to the elemental spirits of the world, why then? as if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to regulations? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, referring to all things that perish as they are used according to human precepts and teachings. These things have an appearance of wisdom, promoting self-made religion and asceticism, severity to the body, but they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. All right, think about this. I've seen guys going down the road, they're whipping themselves. And they're doing this as a religious rite, and, and you know, they're punishing themselves, uh, trying to avoid sin, all right? Correct me if I'm wrong, I don't know any place in the Bible that commands Christians to punish somebody else, including themselves. <laughs> it's all mental. We take every thought captive, the Bible says. We focus on the things that are good and right and pure and honorable. We think on these things. You think about the Spanish Inquisition the awful things that were done in the name of Christianity. Where did they get scripture for that? We're not, it's not my job to punish somebody. That's God's job. God's going to take care of this. All right? You see somebody in sin, you want to reason with them. You see somebody that is lost, you want to save them. They're drowning in sin or whatever. We want to go out and do all we can to save them. It's not my job to punish them. That's God's job. And all through history, you, you've, done, you've had things done in the name of religion. And, you know, well, you know, they may be doing wrong over there, but it's not my job to go kill them. And, you know, all through, you read history, the, the Catholics and the Protestants would have wars. Uh, because, you know, well, you're wrong, and we're going we're gonna to kill you because of that. Where do you get that, you know? Um, anyway, that's, I, I, I've got 30 preachers, I can't help myself. <laughs> uh, so you, you get that idea. Uh, asceticism is the harsh treatment of the body. Always in Christianity. It's a balance. Yeah, we need to take our body, we need to be in control of our body. But we don't want to be mean to it. Okay. I remember 
my uncle one time. Uh, he's talking about, well, he's got this thing that's really scrubbing his hair, you know. I said, well, you want to clean it. You don't want to punish it for being hair. <laughs> well, there's always a balance. And so many times, it's not, you know, one extreme or the other extreme. It's here in the middle. And that's a whole different lesson. But, you know, we need to take our control of our body, yes. But it's not our job to punish it for being our body. They had the idea that the body was evil. Now, whatever you did with it, it doesn't really matter, which is it's crazy. And the Gnostics, you know, they kind of got into, well, I have superior knowledge. And we're going we're gonna to circle back around to that. But all this has a appearance of wisdom. And so, you know, these guys that are whipping themselves or whatever, man, that's really dedicated. Uh, you, you know, and people admire that. Well, it appears wise. Well, it's not so good. All right, is, is kind of the idea there. Um, all right, so the problem, we'll talk about uh, the all-sufficiency of Christ. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll come back to that. We talked about the worship of angels, Colossians 2.18. Uh, then these things, Colossians 2.23, these things appear wise. They promote a self-made religion. They promote asceticism. They promote severity to the body, to the body, Paul says. But what does he say about all these? They are of no value. No value. It's worthless. All this stuff you do. Worthless. All right. So this letter uh, designed to counter the Colossian heresy and call the church back to the pure faith. How are we doing? Ooh. Time just goes by faster uh, when you're doing this. Let's talk about some cultural references. Uh, some want to say that this is a Christian hymn in chapter 1, verses 15 through 20. And in fact, in some Bibles, uh, it is set apart as poetry. How do they know? And we've mentioned this in other letters. And I've looked at some, you know, sometimes you look at that, well, I, you know. The problem is we're reading it in another language. Uh, and so, you know, if you translate an English poem into another language, it's probably not going to rhyme, okay? Uh, and some of this poetry today that doesn't rhyme, I don't get that, you know. <laughs> They'll call anything poetry, you know, uh, just because they've written it in. I don't quite get it, you know. It's, that's beyond my understanding. Uh, but, you know, they said this was like a Christian hymn because of stylistic uh, reasons, the way, it, the way it's styled. There's a rhythmical lilt when the passages are read out loud. You have to read it in, in the original language, of course. Then there's linguistic. You use different words. Uh, when you're writing a poem. Uh, the songs in our songbook, uh, those are sometimes special words that we don't use anywhere else. And so a newcomer comes into church, you know, what's all this stuff mean? What are you singing about? Because, you know, we're, we're used to these words, all right? So, you know, have a little pity on the guy that is just coming in. Explain some of these. Uh, what's an Eben Kenyon? We sing night with Eben Kenyon. You know. Well, what are you talking about? You know, these are things that we don't talk about much. And it's a good thing to uh, stop and, and look at these things, the specialized vocabulary. All right, look in 115. This is going to be come up a couple of times. When it calls Christ the firstborn of all creation. Now, the Jehovah's Witness will want to take this and say, well, he wasn't really God. He's like a second-rate kind of not God. 
Uh, they don't. They don't want to put Christ up there and call him deity. Uh, we are all sons and daughters of God in one sense. Uh, but what's he say? He is the firstborn of all creation. Well, does that mean he was made? Which is what they would say. All right. Did God create him and then let him create everything else? Is the idea. All right, so this refers not to chronological order, but to rank. All right, and there are examples of this: Exodus 4:22 and 23, Psalms 89, 27, Psalms 88, 28. Uh, Psalms 89 says, "I will make," or the other translation says, "Appoint him firstborn, the highest of the king of kings." appointed position. I'm going to make this thing happen. All right? uh, Exodus 4.22 uh, Then you shall say to Pharaoh, thus says Lord Israel is my firstborn son. God give birth to Israel? Well, no, he made them top rank. All right? They were his special people. Uh, Psalms 88.28 is the third reference. Same thing. So the context makes clear Jesus was not created. All right. We're gonna we're gonna look at John 14, 8 and 9. That Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. Jesus said, Have I been with you so long that you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. What's he saying? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. How can he be more plain? <laughs> um, when they ask Jesus, who are you? And he says, I am. They picked up stones to stone him. Why? He's claiming to be God. They understood that. <laughs> and people today do not. Uh, John 3.16. The idea of monogenes. Uh, God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Well, he was, was he born? Does that mean he's second-rate God, that he's not really deity? That word monogenes means only one of his kind. And we could spend the whole session just talking about that one word. Uh, I sat in those sessions. Uh, the idea is, He's not a son like we're sons and daughters of God. We're adopted into the family of God. Because Matt is my son, does that mean he's less of a Vic? Well, no, <laughs> he's still a Vic, all right? Jesus is still deity. Now, how this works before time, how the Trinity works, I don't understand every aspect. If I did, I'd be God, right? But my idea was, at some point before the foundation of the world, Jay, you are my son. You know, Jesus took on that role. He was equal to God. He was God. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. And the Word was God. Now, New English translation, which is the Jehovah's Witness, they will say the word was like a God. Don't let, don't, don't let them do that. All right? You write your own translation, you can get by with stuff like that. Um, but it's not there. All right, so let's move on. The mystery. They promoted a mystery religion. And people have done this throughout the years. There's just a special few of us that are enlightened, and all the other peons, they just have to fall in line behind us, is kind of the idea. The Dead Sea Scrolls, that community, maybe it was the Essenes, uh, they had this idea, later Gnostics, the pagan mystery religions, all had the idea, you know, where there's some elite ones of us that are enlightened, and the rest of you peons, you just better fall in line. 
All right. Look in Colossians 1, 24. Keep this in mind. Is Paul keeping secrets here? Look what he says. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake in my flesh. I'm filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is the church. His body is the church, verse 25. But I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given for me for you, uh, given to me for you. Listen, to make the word of God fully known. Does it sound like he's keeping secrets? Verse 26. The mystery that was hidden for ages and generations, but now is revealed to a select few. Is that what it says? No. To his saints, verse 27. To them God chose to make known how great among Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. This mystery that was hidden for ages is the Messiah. And angels wanted to see what was going to happen. The Old Testament prophets would write through inspiration, then they'd go back and study what they had written because they wanted to know. But what? He says, now it's revealed to you. All right. Boy, I ran way short today. A lot of background uh, that is in Colossians uh, that I'd love to talk about. We'll have to save that for another day.